You are listening to episode 14 of Leaders on Purpose podcast. Hi there. Welcome to Leaders on Purpose podcast. This is your host, Manal Bernoussi. I am a multi-passionate mom of twins and a corporate executive in Casablanca, Morocco, living and sharing my personal development journey. In this podcast, we're looking to develop the skills, habits, and mindset to reveal our full potential for a greater purpose. I'll be inviting inspiring people, beautiful souls, Moroccans, Canadians, Americans, Nigerians, and more, people from all backgrounds and different nationalities to inspire us to live our true purpose and create great impact. So join me every other Sunday and let's make this happen. Hey everyone, this is Manal speaking. Welcome to a very special episode of Leaders on Purpose podcast. We're honoring International Women's Day. In some parts of the world, it's Women's History Month. And while the cause for inclusion, diversity and parity is really not the cause of one day or one month or even one year, it should be an everyday focus However, these marks are really great opportunities to reflect on collaborative efforts of both men and women and to focus our conversations for a while on the topic of gender parity. How do we keep moving the needle and how do we move forward from an individual and collective point of view? My guest today is Mayowa Kuyuro. She's a partner in McKinsey's Lagos office in Nigeria, and she leads McKinsey's financial institutions practice in West Africa. She has extensive experience across West, South, and East Africa, serving major institutions, both in the public and private sector. I'll reference her full bio for you in the notes of this episode. And she is the co-author of several published research reports. And the one we're talking about today that absolutely blew my mind is The Power of Parity, Advancing Women's Equality in Africa. I listened to some of the findings of this report at an event I was attending last week, and I was like, I need to have Mayowa on the podcast. Many of us will be on panel discussions or having conversations with colleagues about this in the upcoming week, and we can all use some real data and strong messages to help raise the awareness and do something at our own level. So I reached out to her, and here we are. Mayowa, thank you so much for being with us here today. We made this happen on such short notice. Welcome to Leaders on Purpose podcast. Thank you, Manal. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Thank you. So let's kick off this conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and the journey that led you to where you are now? Absolutely. So I was born in, uh, in Nigeria. I'm the first of, of four kids. So I have the typical firstborn daughter sense of responsibility um, with as all good uh, uh, daughters do I studied sciences in uh, <laughs> in university um, and then when I was um, when I finished I, I thought very hard and and and, and um, about what I was going to do after university now I had so, sort of done engineering but I didn't really like it and I was sort of trying to figure out what sort of made the be next best, best step um, and my friends, interesting, said to me, I think you should try consulting. Um, you seem to, you, I think would be very good for me. And I was like, oh no, I definitely can't go to consulting. It's like for very, very smart people. Um, uh, but then I also wanted to move back to Nigeria and I had a, a certain parameters of the type of institution I wanted to work at. I wanted to work at a global institution that would give me a good sort of ground base for sort of whatever it is I wanted to do after that. Um, and, you know, somehow I found myself uh, applying to, to McKinsey and a couple of other consulting firms. Um, I got into McKinsey and it was a, a very easy choice for me because they were opening a Lagos office and um, I wanted to be back home. And I became the first business analyst that was uh, hired into the McKinsey Lagos office when it opened in 2010. Um, and I spent two years as a business analyst working across Africa, learning the continents. I always say it took me leaving the continents actually to learn about the continents and me leaving Nigeria to learn about Nigeria. And I learned a lot about, um, you know, the world in which I live. 
Um, after that, I moved to Australia because that's what you do <laughs> um, immediately <laughs> after my, my, my tenure as a business analyst. Um, and I was working for a bank in Australia. Then I went to business school um, for two years. And there, it was a great time for me to reflect and actually think to myself, do I want, it was another point for me to think, do I want to come back to the continent? Do I want to be here? Um, and I explored, I will, I'll be very honest, I explored various different um, uh, opportunities to work, you know, in, in the United States and other sort of more uh, developed markets. But my heart knew that it's in Africa, it's where I want to be, it's where I feel I'm called to be and where I have a mission. And so I moved back home and we joined McKinsey um, and I've been there ever since, uh, sort of doing financial services uh, across the continent. And um, it's been a it's been a journey. It's been it's been a lot of learnings, um, but it's one that has made me quite happy and fulfilled as as an individual. Right. And that's, you know, people ask me all the time. I know you haven't asked this question, but people ask me all the time, why are you still at McKinsey or why are you still in consulting? And, and the answer for me is I actually feel very, very fulfilled. Um, it's a it's it's sort of I feel a, a sense of purpose um, and a sense of calling doing what I do. I love that. A lot of things resonate with me. Um, the, the, the calling to go back to um, your home country, which is exactly what I did also. And in 2010, that's a common th thing between uh, both of us. Uh, I used to work in Paris and then uh, came back to Morocco in 2010. And, you know, this quest for purpose, it's yeah. something we talk about a lot on this podcast and really the quest for fulfillment. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Mayula, you have co-authored um, a fascinating report, The Power of Parity. And some figures in that report really struck me. The first one is it would take us 142 years to reach some sort of parity in Africa. That's seven generations. And also another figure that like blew my mind is that our continent could benefit from a 10% increase of GDP if we reach that, that parity. Can you talk us a little bit through why gender parity in the workplace is so important and just more generally your thoughts about this topic? Absolutely. Um, and by the way, hearing you quote those figures, uh, Talek talking about 142 years, 10% uh, additional GDP is exactly the reason why we wrote the report. Um, I remember when we launched the report, we launched it at the World Gender Forum um, in, at the end of 2018. And I had people from organizations, sort of large multilateral organizations telling me that the reports would form the basis for sort of fact-based advocacy, right? I think it's important. A lot of the times when we have gender parity discussions, the discussions are sort of emotive and perhaps not anecdotal. And it was important for us to, to create the fact base to be able to have the conversations in an in a intelligent, in a, in a very, very fact-based manner. So thank you so much. Um, it makes me happy to, to hear you create the figures. Um, why is gender parity important? You know, it's for me, I, I think about it, and I think that's the tenets of the report. We think about it in two angles. One is parity in society, which looks at sort of the indications, uh, sort of indicators along a number of dimensions, things like healthcare, inclusion, sort of social representation, and so on and so forth. We also look at parity in the workplace. And I think the reason we do both is I don't think you can, as an individual, I'm not the sum total of only the society I'm in or the work I'm in. I think I, it's for me to be, a, a, for example, a good professional, I need to have access to adequate healthcare, right? So I'm, I'm well and, and, and all of that. So I think both are, are interlinked. One of the things or one of the reasons we bring it to the workplace in, in particular, you know, I always say this, gender parity is not about, you know, doing the right thing or doing the good thing. It, it actually, the research shows that when you have sort of diverse boards, diverse executive management, you actually see uh, an increase, right? You see a little bit of an increase in the performance of the company. So that is, you know, I don't know what much could, I could say to convince if you're, if you're sort of a business person, you are going to perform better when you have diverse 
voices in the room. And then the fact of the matter is that women, I, you know, I, I can't remember if this is true or not, but I think it is. Women make up half the population. So why would you exclude half of the insights, the knowledge, the brain power into your organization if you're not making it a place that women can thrive and succeed? Um, and I think the third thing for me is, you know, where we're, we want you want to be able, not only is it half the ideas, but if you're making something, you also want people who have that perspective, right? If you're selling, you're making a widget or you're making whatever it is, you want people who also understand the other perspective and the other side. So again, why would you not exclude, why would you exclude or, or create a place where women cannot thrive? So I think for me, gender parity in the workplace is important because we're talking about half the population we're talking about diversity of ideas, which always makes it even better. Um, and we're talking about the fact that you can also have the other, you know, you can also have another perspective that enables you to, to serve your, your customers, your clients, whomever better. Um, so it's sort of that those are some of my thoughts around sort of why parity uh, uh, is important in the workplace. Thank you so much. It's always insightful to hear other people's perspectives on this topic. We might be uh, stating the obvious for many of us, but it's not for everybody or else the numbers wouldn't be that bad, right? As you said, why wouldn't you benefit from the perspective of half the population of the world? So it's really helpful to articulate those thoughts and keep reminding everyone why it is not only the right thing to do, but it's also the financially smart thing to do. Okay, I'd love for us to move to another section of the report, which we should all be talking about. And it's the five barriers to gender equality in the formal workplace. This came up from interviewing senior women in the corporate world. And the first point is societal and cultural expectations. Can you please elaborate a little bit on this one? You know, I, 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 I come from a... Actually, Nigeria is very interesting, but I, I come from a country that is still primarily patriarchal, which means that you expect I might be working same as uh, my partner, um, but I'm the one who's expected to be responsible for the upkeep of the house because it's a societal expectation. That's the case I'm in expected, so many countries. Yeah, exactly. I'm expected to be seen and not heard, you know, in certain circumstances because, you know, women are not supposed to be, um, are not supposed to be outspoken and so on and so forth. And sometimes people internalize those, those, those expectations and it comes out in the workplace. So I had someone who told me that when she goes into a room of men, which unfortunately a lot of our workplaces look like, she isn't able to be articulate, even though I think this is one of the, she's a promising young um, 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 professional, but that is then hampering her ability to be successful at work because she's not able to voice her opinions because of some of the um, ingrained um, expectations that she's, she's sort of internalized. So I think, and then also on the flip side, when men see women in, in sort of positions that they're not used to, right, because of what they've been um, sort of brought up to, to expect, it also is a little bit of a limiting factor for women. So I think we need to go through a complete re-education, right, and, and helping to shape norms how are you bringing up your sons? How are you bringing up your daughters? So if your son and your daughter are playing, do you tell your daughter, come and wash dishes or come and cook? Or do you tell both of them to come and do it because they're both jointly responsible for home chairs, right? I, I remember growing up and all the, all the women and all the, the, the fe young females would be in the kitchen while the guys were playing. That is, we, we, need to, you know, we need to break those things because they're, they're, they're real and they're there and because that's expectations we need to break. Oh yeah, absolutely. It starts at a very young age and it's all those tiny little details on a daily basis that shape the mentality. As you said, how do we raise our sons? How do we raise our daughters? What role models do they have around? And also what's the narrative that goes inside their heads? Most women, all the women that I know, most women that I ever met with have been raised from the time they were little that to be a good woman is to be good for other people. 
So if you're a good mom to your children, if you're a good wife for your husband, if you're a good sister, daughter, friend, then you're a good woman. And the hard part about that is your value is fully wrapped up in someone else's perception of you, which is crazy, right? You cannot drive your inner worth from the outside. So I love that this societal and cultural expectations came up as number one. It Um, is. Let me give you one more example, actually, that is very real which is, and it, it, you, you struck a thought as you were speaking, which is we're all sitting on a table, um, we're in a meeting, and uh, the woman is expected to get up and serve the tea and coffee, where we are all peers, right? And the woman, I, I've seen it, I've actually seen it happen a number of times where the woman is summoned to, to come and get uh, tea and coffee. Why, why not the men, right? Why not the men? And it's, you're, being, you're trying to be helpful but sometimes those are sort of I would, what I would term career limiting um, helpfulness activities. Yeah, or being the only one to be asked to take notes at a meeting consistently. And that's the unconscious bias also. It happens everywhere. It happens at work. It happens in the workplace. So we definitely need to break those habits and break the bias. Which leads us to the second barrier that has been identified in the report, which is unconscious bias in the workplace. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? So unconscious bias essentially is, and this, this, these are, I think, learn. well, I wouldn't use the word learned behaviors, but things you think are not necessarily overt, but it affects the way you would, um, you would, you, you make assumptions about certain people based on sort of physical attributes that have nothing to do with who they are. Um, and I will give you an example of something that happened to me today, mm-hmm. right? And, and this unconscious bias, you think it's only men, but it's actually everybody who has these unconscious biases. I am used to being in a place where quite a significant number of my colleagues are, are male, right? Um, if I think about my mentors and people I work with, my clients, a, a disproportionate number of them, you know, close to 90% of them are, are male. And I met... Um, somebody today with her partner um, and I automatically assumed that the partner was the person who is working at McKinsey and she was the significant other. Automat- I did not question, there was nothing in my mind that questioned that, that bias or that mm-hmm. assumption that she was not the, the, the um, sort of my colleague and, and a consultant in the firm. And I felt very, very bad about it. Because here I am, a woman, someone who's done the research, someone who's supposed to be drinking and giving up the Kool-Aid. But yet, because of the environment that I am in day in, day out, I've internalized that sort of bias that most, con- most consultants and most people who are sort of within my sphere would be male, Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. to me, it's a, it's, I, I, I spent the last <laughs> hour or two since that happened, just thinking about it, thinking about me, who I am as switched on. I'm a female, as you could think about on this particular topic, I am still, you know, the, I'm still a, 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 someone who has unconscious biases. So imagine the rest of the world who just doesn't spend who don't spend time thinking about this, these issues. Think about all the little assumptions that you make based on on people's physical attributes that have absolutely no um, bearing on their ability to perform, on their ability to deliver, on their ability to be a good professional. And think about the the Herculean task we have to, to do to break these biases. Yes, thank you for reminding us that unconscious bias hits both men and women. And this actually reminds me of a video that went viral a while ago. It was sort of an experiment with many people, different ages, different nationalities, um, different gender, and they were asked to solve a riddle. And the riddle goes something like... um, A father is about to bring his son to a job interview, applying at a large company. And just as they arrive to the parking lot, the son's phone rings. So he looks at at his father who says, go ahead, you can take the call. 
And the caller is the trading company CEO who says, good luck, son, you've got this. So the son ends the call and looks again at his father. How is this possible? And <laughs> you, you see all the confused looks and faces of everyone in the video, men and women, trying to make sense of it when the simple answer was that the CEO is his mom. So yeah, as you said, because of the environment we're in, we, we all fall in these traps and it's, it's definitely something <laughs> we have to keep working on. Now, another barrier that is still so real in our working environment is unhelpful workplaces. And that is number three in the report. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes, um, this one is one of my favorite examples to give. Um, Cheryl Sandberg in her book talked about when she was pregnant um, and she was in, I think she was in a, a, the board of a company or something. And there were no female um, lavatories or, or washrooms around the board meeting. And so she would have to waddle to, um, you know, somewhere far to use the bathroom. Or, you know, another one that is now my favorite is, is um, another example that I like to give is when you have returning mothers coming back to work, um, sometimes there's no room for them to pump. Yeah, their milk. No, right. mm. Nowhere for them to pump their milk. They are pumping the milk that will go to their children in a car, in a bathroom sometimes, you know, just situations where personally, I just would be horrified to be pumping. Um, and that's an unhelpful. So if I were someone who is in that situation, I will make a, ca you know, I would think twice before returning back to work. I would think twice completely or before even if I'm pregnant, I'm like, mm, if I have to go far to use a bathroom or if I'm, if I'm, um, if I can't find somewhere to pump comfortably in a hygienic environment, is it worth coming back to work? Yeah. Right. And so how do we make our workplaces structurally more friendly for women who by nature of biology just need that little bit of consideration? Those are examples of sort of unhelpful workplaces. Absolutely. Those are real life situations and facing them would definitely be helpful and more encouraging. Let's talk about the next one. Um, number four, lack of sponsorship for women. We really need men as allies for sponsoring women to the top. You know, I, do, I, I mentioned earlier that 90% of my mentors and sponsors are males. And I think that I'm probably an anomaly, right? I'm, I'm a big anomaly because people tend to sponsor, to gravitate, to have to be friends with people who look like them. Mm. Right? Let, let's call a spade a spade. Yeah. Um, and so with women, it's that much more difficult because you don't have enough women sort of creating that pull um, to get people at the middle, at the bottom of the career up. And so you don't have... Um, you just don't have the sponsorship that that is required to get sort of women further along in their careers. Mm. Um, and, and then also, you know, I was telling somebody, imagine you're from a conservative background and some of the ways mentorships and sponsorship um, relationships are formed are, it's not necessarily on what you do within the context of work. It's like, oh, you know, let's go out for drinks. Let's do this, let's do that. And you might not necessarily be comfortable with that. How do you form those relationships with people of the opposite sex um, in, in, in those situations? And again, it just creates that extra hurdle yeah. uh, for women in the workplaces. Yes. And this is also why we need supportive communities. You know, I often share that I'm part of two wonderful communities here in Morocco with both men and women mentoring other women leaders and also CEOs willing to sponsor women and get them to the boardrooms. And this collaboration is absolutely key to advancing the cause of gender parity. We need men as allies and we need more women cheering for other women and helping them out. So, yeah. Okay, now we're moving to the last and fifth barrier that is mentioned in the report, which is limited mindset among women. And I love talking about this topic, by the way. This podcast really focuses on the mindset and breaking through our limiting beliefs. So tell us more about your perspective on this, Mayoa. Again, I, I, 
it's very it's very interesting when you see people take themselves out of the running Mm -hmm. um before you even like are in the race (laughs) and so you have people talking about all the barriers as to why they can't do this and why they can't do that um i i think it was the it's the it's actually the french and the the new york lotter that say winners are people who at least tried right you have to at least try um, and you see sometimes you think, oh, I can't do this because I'm a woman. I can't do that because I'm a woman. And I think it's linked to the first point about expectations mm-hmm. because we internalize a lot of that and think that some things are insurmountable or, or cannot be um, uh, uh, done. You know, um, my friend uh, has a story about going to speak to um, girls in an all girls school. And when she asked how many of you want to be president Mm. less than five of the girls raised their hands so she Mm. asked oh you know what do you want to be and they were happy saying i want to be the first lady i want to do this i want to do that um and we and i think it's again about the expectations it's Mm -hmm. a it's a vicious cycle it's an expectation it's about what you're taught at home about the role that women are going to play and then what you then believe and then it just comes round and round and round again so we take ourselves out of the running and out of the race and out of consideration before you know the game has even started so one of the things you have to constantly remind yourself at least I have to constantly remind myself is one I'm in this room because I have something to contribute right I wouldn't be here if I didn't have anything to contribute secondly um nobody's doing me a favor right yes so 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 the, don't feel grateful the one of these is to be happy to, i'm so grateful to be here and so on I'm like no you've you've done the work you have something to contribute no one is doing you a favor um and then your ideas are equally as valid there's no monopoly of of good ideas so you're in the room make it count and so that's come something i have to constantly remind myself over and over again it's not something that I you know I, I, I want and I'm like yes I'm ready I'm ready I'm ready it's something I have to constantly remind myself every day because there are so many things that would chip away at you at your self-confidence and just put self-doubt in you yes. but it's I think it's up to you to remind yourself that you're an awesome individual and you deserve to be wherever it is you are Oh, absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much. And, you know, when we talk about, I I like to say that before we break through the glass ceiling or while we're breaking through the glass ceiling, we have to break through our own limiting beliefs. And Mm -hmm. that's really uh, work we need to be doing on ourselves all the time because it's, well, first, the first thing is to get the job done, right? That's like fundamental. (laughs) There's no question to that. Whatever industry we're at, we need to master what it is that we're doing. I I feel that's the best way to serve the cause also is that we women get the job done. And while we're doing that, working also on our limiting beliefs to navigate that extra toughness that comes from this gender gap, because as you said, um, there is a lot of, you know, internal um, saboteurs and imposter Mm -hmm. syndrome and so many other Mm -hmm. things and that stuff we need to be working on it and also talking about it Um, like sharing experiences helps a lot personally I'm talking from my personal um, um, experience it helps me a lot to be in these communities of with other women and also mentoring younger women and just really talking about these topics. It's really, really helpful. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, No problem. Can I just build on something you said that I think is very important, which is this idea that you need to get the job done, right? That is the hygiene factor. That is the base. That's what gets you into the room. And unfortunately, you know, research shows this, that men, the world is more forgiven to men who make mistakes or who aren't as high performers as it is to women. They're far more, I can't remember what the exact percentage is, but they're far more forgiven of mm-hmm. men than they are of women. So what that means, unfortunately, is that you as a woman in the workplace, absolutely, I always say, don't give them an excuse. <laughs> yeah, I know it's not yeah. a war. <laughs> it's not a war or anything. <laughs> because that's the that's the other side where you're now very militant it's not yeah. that no it's but not that don't give people an excuse to say this is why i don't hire women don't mm. give them an excuse mm. so it's important 
that you are good, whatever your profession is, whatever your craft is, whatever it is, your skill is, be good at it. Mm. Be good at it. Do your work, do the work, right? And then let it speak for you as well. Absolutely. I can't agree more. And, you know, there are all the hard skills, but also, you know, all those soft skills that we are not, that we don't learn at school, like just leading with authenticity. And um, I, I feel it is so important today. You're, we're moving from IQ to EQ to emotional intelligence. And mm -hmm. these are all aspects that are much needed because today it's not about getting things done no matter what. It's also, are you creating impact around you? Are you, do you have that emotional intelligence to understand other people's perspectives? We're all you know, different. And so that, that personal development aspect, working on our um, mindset, on bro broadening our soft skills is also absolutely key. And I feel we should bring in more of that to the corporate world also. Um, okay, we're going to do something fun now. <laughs> I ask the audience to share some situations they faced or statements where gender bias was involved. And I'd love to have your reaction to each one of those and how you would respond to them. I think that would be really helpful to many and just gives a different perspective to our male colleagues. Because again, oftentimes these situations do not come from the wrong place. They are not intended to be inappropriate. But if we do not talk about them, it, it, it just carries on that gender bias, you know? So let's go through some of them and you tell me, do you laugh it off or do you call it out? Okay, so the first one that was shared with me is you're in a meeting room and a male colleague cuts you off and speaks over you and does so consistently. Do you call it out or do you laugh it off? You know, a lot of these are contextual. A lot of these things are contextual, but um, I, I when I say contextual, I mean it depends on how confident you are <laughs> with confrontation and who is doing uh, some of these things. But I, I would tell you that my instinct is to um, call it out and, and politely, or maybe depending on how irked I am, on politely say, "May I finish, please?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. But I am also not particularly known to be a shrinking violet so I, I think in that situation I would call it out yeah uh, you know some one thing that works pretty well I feel especially with the meetings over zoom is to go um there was probably an inch a technical itch but I was saying this and then you just reiterate what you were saying that's a good tip I will I will definitely use that one you know, in, <laughs> in the future that's a good tip <laughs> um a second one here. So you're in a meeting and you just shared your opinion and no one reacts. Then the next person who happens to be a male colleague says exactly the same thing and then everyone approves. What do you think about that? You know, it's again, a very interesting, it, that's a very interesting circumstance because sometimes I wonder if it's, you know, when you say someone says exactly the same thing, is it exactly the same thing word for word? Is it exactly the same idea? you know, or is it about the delivery of the idea? And, and I think if it's someone says, someone enhances my point, right? And, and, um, and sort of communicates in a way, better way, a way much better than I, than I did. I'm actually not too precious about it. You know, no problem. We're here to build off each other and it's okay, especially within the context of like brainstorming or team problem solving. Yeah, I love the perspective that you bring to this one because I think it ties back to the topic of mindset and working on ourselves. It takes a strong and growth mindset to go, well, it's interesting that I thought exactly the same thing, but somehow it wasn't received the same way. Maybe the people in the room are biased or maybe I just have to work on my delivery. I love that. Okay, so here's another interesting one that was shared with me on social media. One of the team leaders says, oh, I'm so glad to have two ladies with me in the team. Who doesn't like to have beautiful company? <laughs> How do you react to that? <laughs> yes, that's a very, um, that's a very, that's a very interesting one. Um, I think, again, I, I think there's a problem with being a consultant because I can see both sides of the issue, right? Um depending and and i think again context if it's somebody if it was somebody who i don't necessarily have a relationship and i felt 
it was quite inappropriate. I would um, say, well, I hope you know you're also interested in what we have to say because we're here for a business meeting or you know or our ideas or make it very explicit that you know we're not just about um, um beauty right because you know on the other hand someone is trying to be complimentary and you don't necessarily want to put their backs off and i think this is the diplomacy that is required in these sort of um circumstances um you know but then i'll, I'll give you a <laughs> I'll give you an example that irks me a lot um, as a, a, a Black woman. My hair changes quite, um, quite often, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and I have, sometimes I have, I have colleagues who, who, who mention it all the time, right? And, and again, this is within, and, and sometimes I have to pull them out and say, well, my friend, I don't know, I don't talk about when you get a haircut. So why is my hair all of a sudden a topic for conversation and like what is that about right um so i think you know there is a bit of wisdom and a bit of diplomacy because sometimes you just have to educate and it's not coming from a bad place right and there's sometimes where you just have to be very draconian and, and cut it off so when with with that particular colleague when i i he said something i was i had joined a meeting big meeting and then he says something about my hair and I'm like well you know thanks for noticing but you know that's the 20th time you've talked about my change in hairstyle we all know my hair changes I never talk about when you have a haircut right so I think you need to figure out when's the right time to to address things yes absolutely and I think you know very often it, it's it doesn't come from uh, it's just this an unconscious bias we're talking about. So that's why it's so important just to inform and to be educating. And once again, as you mentioned, it's not a war, it's just giving another perspective. Because when you are in that situation, very often, I mean, you, you, you just don't have the space or the time to elaborate. And so it's just like that awkward moment, but then you move to the next thing. And so it's really important to have these kinds of conversation where mm -hmm. we get to just express this other perspective and just explain yeah. why it's not serving the cause. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing you should, you can do, and, and people again are not bold enough to have these conversations, right? Is when, if there's something that, is coming from a good place, yeah. but you feel it's making you uncomfortable, feel free. If the person is a good person, feel free to go after the meeting and have a conversation and say, hello, my friend, what you said was completely inappropriate. I have had this conversations with um, sort of my mentors and sponsors when they've said things that I didn't necessarily uh, feel comfortable. And there's no, there's no acrimony, there's no lashback you know, and people are, are, are willing to be, I think I like the word we use, educated. I think there's an education that needs to happen. So people learn more in an environment that is not adversarial. So I don't think there's any reason to make it adversarial. I think it's just educating in your, in your own way and whether or not it's in a big room or in a one-on-one -on -one conversations, please, you know, feel free to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and I have another statement, and I would love to have your reaction to it. To be regarded as a leader, women should behave like men. I completely disagree. Completely disagree. <laughs> because we talked about the diversity of opinions, the fact that you bring a, a different perspective, you know, um, into the room. There is absolutely, and, and I also, there are some attributes that are, correctly or incorrectly ascribed to men so for example being very logical that is not a male attribute that is just you know an attribute right or or, or or and so on and so forth so um please i think part of our power and part of what we bring is the fact that we are not men right so if anyone says that to you please say thank you very much but no thanks <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, here's a one, a one last one. Um, there's someone in the team that's talking about um, a colleague and he's saying about her, I'm not sure she could handle the pressure. And there's a lot of traveling involved. She just had a baby. So I'm not sure she's the best fit. I think whoever's in the room needs to say, let's not make decisions on behalf of that person you know, and, and call it out. Say, look, let's, why don't you ask her or the, the individual and see 
whether or not um, they're interested. And then also the, the flip side to that is, would you be having this conversation if it was a returning father um, that you know, we were considering? Would you actually take her out of the race or take him out of the race um, if, it was, if it wasn't a returning father? I think sort of making those two statements about one, don't make, don't make decisions on behalf of someone without at least asking her. And then secondly, if it was a returning father, would you have this implicit um, um, conversation or explicit conversation about taking him out of the race because he's a returning father and sort of hold the mirror up to whomever is, is making that statement? Yes, well, I, I'm sure this will give um, an interesting perspective to all those who share this situation with us. Um, I'd like us to move to another topic we talk a lot about on this podcast, and it's work-life balance. Can you tell us a little bit about how you navigate work-life balance, especially in such a demanding industry like consulting is? Uh, that's a, a hard one. Um, I will be the first person to raise up my hand and say, look, for the most part of my career, I probably did not get the equation right. Um, but I think with maturity and also with the way the world has has evolved, it, it's becoming, uh, it's not, it's becoming, it is a priority of mine. Um, the first thing that I'm going to say, and I think this was a piece of advice that I um, I always remember was, is that don't let anybody define for you what work, work-life balance is. You know, for some people, work-life balance means I can work Monday to Friday um, and not have to do anything. Some people, it, you know, I need one day off a week because of X reason. Some people, it's like I need a predictable night off. Whatever your work-life balance is, or for some people, it's like I work intensely for three months at a time, and then I need to take two months off sabbatical. Um, you know, just whatever your own definition of work-life balance is, I think, first of all, you need to be true to yourself and, and sort of recognize whatever it is. Um, I think the second thing is, we are actually very fortunate because we're now in a world where it is becoming increasingly a part of the conversation. So mm -hmm. when I first entered my um, and started consulting, honestly, I can't remember too many conversations about work-life balance. <laughs> but now, I, I it's a conversation I have at least at least you know once a week. It's probably more than that, at least once a week. So. I think we're fortunate that this is now something that's priority across the board. Across the board. Um, and I think if you define for yourself what your own version of work-life balance is, then I think it's up to you. I think there is personal responsibility in creating and ensuring that your work is balanced with your life. Mm -hmm. I think one of the cop-outs we tend to give ourselves is, oh, my employer is not allowing me to do X, Y, or Z. But actually, no, you permit it mm -hmm. what situation you're in. Um, and I always tell people, nobody's going to say no on your behalf. As much as long as you continue to say yes, there's going to be continue to be someone ready to take from you. And so I think you have to take personal responsibility in ensuring that you are able to live the life and create the life um, that you want. And then also take the hard decisions, right? For example, if my own version of work-life balance means that I'm unfortunately not able to um, advance as, as fast as I would like. That is okay. It's a trade-off I've made. I, this is, I, you know, this part of my life is equally as important as that part of my life. And I'm okay that this part of my life is not going as fast because I'm prioritizing that part of my life. Completely okay. But then there has to be internal congruence uh, with your decisions, right? Um, and, and, and just making sure that you are creating. I think we, we, um, we're very quick not to realize the power that we have, right? We're always, we don't want to say no, but the world will not end. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, taking personal responsibility and driving that is perhaps um, one of the big, my biggest takeaways. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, that alignment and talking about personal responsibility. I think many are listening as, to us today and thinking, what could they do on a personal level to help with this cause? Um, what would be some of your thoughts about that? Like, if you're a middle management, not necessarily 
uh, leading the company. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd love your perspective on both. Uh, what can we do on an individual level? Absolutely. Um, I think the first thing is recognizing where there's a problem. I think the, the, the not sweeping it under the carpet uh, or saying, no, it's not that bad or whatever, or, you know, um, even with me today, like I said, I had a very, very stark moment of realization that I'm also part of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think recognizing where there is a problem and recognizing kind of, you know, the fact that things are not where they need to be, I think that's perhaps step number one. Step number two is something I always ask people, which is as a man, you don't even have to be at the top. As a manager today, how many women have you said, I am going to take personal responsibility for to ensure that they are successful in, you know, their, on their careers? So, you know, who are you sponsoring? Who are you mentoring? Um, whether it's in the workplace or outside of the workplace, how many people are you doing? The third thing is, what are the structural things you're doing around yourself? So I'm very fortunate. I work in a team-based environment and I have the ability to, to select my own teams. So one of the things I absolutely, like to me, it's a hard rule that I do not break is that whenever I am staffing or putting together a team, I make sure that there is at least one woman on my team. I will not work in a team where there isn't, apart from myself, mm -hmm. because I will not work in a team where there isn't at least one woman. Mm -hmm. I, I just will not do it. And that is a stance that I have taken uh, to make sure. And then the fourth thing I would say is how forgiven of women are you? And how do you, you know, what are the things that you do as a manager to make it easy or not easy for women to work? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Do you call, especially for women who are, are mothers and I think you know I think for, for the most part it's 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 not too bad when you know them but I think women with children face an even harder sort of burden do you call meetings at times when they are likely to be sort of being the primary caregivers of their their, their, their children so 7 30 meeting when they are likely to be going on a school run mm -hmm. right <laughs> no, not allowing them the flexibility maybe between five and six or six and six, whatever time it is that they need to spend with their children because they're, they're primary caregivers. So what are the things that you structurally can do? And it's not like wholesale macro changes or campaigning or, you know, whatever it is in your organization. It's just you as a manager, how are you structuring your teams or how are you creating an environment that makes it okay for women to thrive and succeed? Mm -hmm. Right. Those are some of the things I, I, I think about um, as someone who leads teams, like how am I making it easy or not easy for women to be successful? How am I mentoring them? How am I creating the right sort of work environments? You know, are there any attitudes or, or, or biases that I have and, and, and not being afraid to, to even call out myself, <laughs> you know, for example, <laughs> when it happens. Right. Um, and then also as you are then in a position of authority and a position where you have sort of senior management heirs, are you creating policies within your, your organization to make it um, easy for women? I think one of the, the things I've seen that is unfortunate is sometimes people think, oh, I suffered. It was not easy for me. And mm -hmm. therefore I have to make sure, you know, I'm not going to make it easier for other people. I mm -hmm. think that is flat out wrong. I think Absolutely. because you've gone through the struggle is enough of a reason to make sure that other people coming after you don't have to go through that struggle as well. So just, just little things, personal things that, you know, are within your power. You know, when we think, think about change, everybody thinks about change at the wholesale micro level. And I just think, no, change begins with you as an individual and the little things you can do to help sort of move the needle and advance, um, um, advance the course. Uh, absolutely. I can't agree more. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I'm loving this conversation, Mayoa, and I, I see we're getting closer to the end of this episode. Before we wrap up, um, I, I'm a mom um, of twins. They are seven years old. Oh, wow. I take very seriously my role as a role model for my daughter. And I'd love to know from you, for all the younger generation that are looking for leaders like you and so many others that lead the way, 
what would be one piece of advice you'd like to leave them with? Um, what's the best advice you have ever received? And like, what are the non-negotiables for them when they are entering the marketplace? I think the one thing that I'm going to stress is you have every right to be in the room. You know, the battles we face in enough external battles, I don't think we should be um, increasing or we should be adding to our battles by our internal self-doubt. So whatever it is you need to do to feel confident. Um, I had a professor in business school who did this whole like power posing thing and it worked like stand in front of a mirror, power pose and go to your meeting and know that you deserve to be in the room. Um, and so don't let self-doubt ever erode your capacity and your ability to deliver, especially when you know you can do it, right? So I think that's perhaps one of the things that, maybe it's because I battled with it, right? One of the things I would, I would say is, is important. I think one of the best pieces of advice, and maybe that's why I'm, I'm harking on it, is just also just get the job done. Yeah. Don't give people an excuse just get the job done be good at what you are you have tons to contribute you have a different perspective you know because of the sum total of the experiences you've had so make sure that you do your best right um be be led by your sense of purpose mm -hmm. and calling and just and just just get the job done I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Mayua, for this conversation. Um, I, I'm really grateful for your time. I know we pulled this out very last minute. So thank you very much once again. And I appreciate you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed having the conversation. So thank you so very much. Um, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I think what you're doing is exactly um, what we need. We need to see more of this. We need to, we need more of you across the continent, right? Um, and, and please do carry on. And if there's anything I can do to be helpful, please just let me know. Thank you so much, Mayua. That means a lot. And for all of you listening to us, here's one final question. How are you going to break the bias? Join the conversation and let us know in the comments on LinkedIn or Instagram. If this message made any impact on you, go ahead and share it with your colleagues and anyone you think would find it useful. Before you leave, hit that subscribe button so you won't miss any of the upcoming episodes. Go check the previous ones also. I can't wait to see you again in two weeks for a new episode of Leaders on Purpose podcast. That is it. Thank you so much for spending your most precious asset with me, which is your time. I am so grateful. If you like what you hear, please take a quick second to hit subscribe, write a review and share with a friend. Spread the love if you think it's something they could benefit from. That will make a huge difference to keep this podcast going. I make it my mission to bring you as much valuable content as possible and absolutely incredible guests. I am back every other Sunday. Thank you so much again for listening and I hope you have an amazing day.